two, 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 two. Oh, yeah, the microphone works. Hello, everyone.
طيب Let's get started. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Holman. This is the Multiplicity session. We have five papers. A couple will be remote. Um, we're going to start today with uh, Angelina Wang um, and Saish Kapoor, Angelina Wang. So um, they're going to talk about against predictive optimization. All right, you guys don't need it. Hi, I'm Angelina. Um, today with Sayosh, we're going to present our work against predictive optimization on the legitimacy of decision-making algorithms that optimize predictive accuracy. So first, I'm going to start out by discussing a few examples of algorithmic failures in the real world. In the Netherlands, a predictive system was used to detect welfare benefit fraud. But misclassifications resulted in thousands of people losing access to their welfare. A company called Epic deployed a sepsis prediction tool in healthcare, but after deployment, this tool was found to have far worse performance in the real world than was originally reported by the developers. In Oregon, a tool that was being considered for predicting which children are most at risk for maltreatment for intervention was found to have racial biases and dropped. And so in our work, we asked the question of why do automated decision systems keep failing? We point out shared critiques that exist across algorithms like these and argue for their illegitimacy. And so there's a variety of prior work that point out flaws in automated decision making and artificial intelligence broadly, which makes similar arguments about exercising caution in deployment. However, the scope of these criticisms can often be unclear. For example, whether a set of arguments that criticize a loan granting algorithm would also apply to a large language model. And so in our work, we very deliberately scope our critique to be about a tight yet widespread category of system such that we can make strong claims about this precise category. And we call this category predictive optimization. And so we define predictive optimization to have three key criteria. First, it uses machine learning to learn the decision rules. Second, it predicts future outcomes. And third, it makes decisions about individuals based on these predictions. So next, I'm going to use college admissions decisions as an example to better illustrate what I mean by this definition of predictive optimization. This Venn diagram shows how these three criteria might overlap. And I'm going to walk through a few different hypothetical algorithms for college admissions, um, and we'll be able to see where they fall in this Venn diagram. So first, one way we could imagine formulating college admissions is with a set of hand-coded rules. For example, admitting any student that meets some minimum GPA cutoff and participation in some number of extracurricular activities. And many public universities, such as the University of California and the University of Texas systems, have some version of this in place for high school graduates in their respective states. However, we would not consider this predictive optimization because while it is automated decision making about a person, it does not use machine learning and it is not predicting the future. So in prior work by Johnson and Zhang, they discussed the pros and cons of these approaches for decision making. Another way we could formulate this is by using a machine learning model that's trained on historical decisions data made by admissions officers. So for example, UT Austin once used a predictive algorithm as part of its computer science graduate admissions, which was trained to predict whether an applicant was admitted in the past by an admissions committee. However, this is still not predictive optimization because while this automated decision making about people now uses machine learning, it's not forecasting the future. As a third possibility, we could consider a machine learning model that ranks high schools by their predicted college performance and admits entire high schools to college at a time. As a slightly different example, we can consider how there are many lists that rank high schools against each other and well-off parents may use this in selecting school districts. And so we could imagine one such list being decided by a machine learning model that ranks schools based on future college admittance. And so while such a formulation of college admissions uses machine learning and is now predicting the future, it is not automated decision making about individual people since it is predicting entire high schools at a time. 
Um, while still potentially dubious, this prediction of trends in a large group is a somewhat easier task than predicting the outcomes of specific individuals. And in our paper, we have more details about why we selected these three criteria for predictive optimization. And finally, we consider a machine learning model that is trained to predict the GPA of each applicant at the end of their first year of college based on the data in their application. So now this is an example of predictive optimization as we've defined it. And so there's a lot that is very appealing about predictive optimization. Whatever achieves the greatest possible accuracy in predicting a concrete outcome of interest is what the policy should be. This means that the rules don't merely reflect just the considered judgment of policymakers, which others might call into question as subjective, and instead they seem to reflect objective patterns in the real world, which could stand on their own. However, in reality, we show that predictive optimization often falls well short of this ideal. And we present seven critiques inherent to predictive optimization, and Sayash will discuss this in our argument next. Thanks, Angelina. Um, so our argument proceeds in three key steps. First, we show that predictive optimization as a category of algorithmic decision making is widespread. So in particular, we went through around 387 um, news articles, Kaggle contests, real world applications, and found that there are already dozens of applications that have been deployed in consequential real world scenarios. Of these 50, we chose eight for in-depth case studies. So we looked at eight of these settings which were especially consequential, and simultaneously, we collected a series of seven flaws with these kinds of systems that have been argued against in previous literature to see how often these flaws apply to these algorithms. Our main finding is that these flaws are common across this entire category of algorithms. In order to um, take a step forward in a more positive direction, we also provide a rubric for assessing the legitimacy of these algorithms, which can be deployed by um, like stakeholders, civil society members, and researchers. But our main focus is to shift the burden of proof for showing why an algorithm is legitimate onto the developers of the algorithms. So this is the set of eight real world case studies that we did. Um, in the interest of time, I'll focus on one, which is child maltreatment prediction using the Allegheny Family Screening Tool. So as many of you may know, um, the Allegheny Family Screening Tool tries to predict which families are at risk of child maltreatment and decides to um, make investigations in these families based on these predictions. And as like lots of prior uh, literature has pointed out severe issues with these, I'll go over three of the seven shortcomings that we find with predictive optimization tools, again, in the interest of time. So the first shortcoming is target construct mismatch. It's hard to measure what we truly care about. So in this case, the construct that the algorithms developers want to predict is child maltreatment. But we can't really measure this directly, let alone predict it. So what do they do? They use two proxies for child maltreatment. The first is community re-referrals, um, like whether two calls were made on behalf of a family. And the second is whether a child was placed into foster care within the next two years. Now, as you can imagine, these methods like, don't really capture the construct of interest perfectly. For instance, in the case of community re-referral, um, it could be that someone is referred to like, the child hotline, uh, child maltreatment hotline, because they're actually being abused. Or it could be a disgruntled neighbor or a family member who has something to um, sort of complain about or, or a brief beef with someone. And, so, and, and this is what has happened in practice. Virginia Eubanks has an amazing book called Automating Inequality, which goes deeper into this. But essentially, these proxies fail to capture the construct of interest. A second issue, which is common to a lot of machine learning, is that the training data rarely matches the deployment setting. So once again, the Allegheny Family Screening Tool is a stark example of this, because the model relies on data available about people who rely on public services. So for instance, if you rely on Medicare, the model has access to your data and makes predictions about you. If you rely on private insurance, there's no way the model has any data about you, let alone make predictions. A third critique is Goodhart's Law. Um, that is, predictive optimization does not account for strategic behavior. So we've seen one example of um, such a setting earlier, like you can have you know, disgruntled neighbors who complain about the family. Another could be an unintended side effect, that when people are scared of surveillance, families who are most in need of help might recede from community networks, which is basically causing the opposite effect that we want the algorithm to have. So as I mentioned, these are three of the seven shortcomings that we find are prevalent across applications of predictive optimization. The rest are on this slide here, and we go into details about how each of these seven apply to the eight applications of interest in our paper. But the key result that I want you all to take away from this presentation is this table. 
So this is a table of the eight applications as rows and our seven shortcomings as the columns. And you'll find that the table has, like, it's extremely dense. So in particular, when we find conclusive evidence that a particular shortcoming applies to an algorithm, that's marked as a full circle. And if we find like partial or circumstantial evidence, mostly because the developers are not transparent, that's a half circle. Now, when we set out to work on this paper, we felt that you know, the table would be dense. We did not expect it to be complete, but that's, what, that's exactly what we found. And further, in the beginning of this presentation, we saw that one of these shortcomings alone is enough to challenge the legitimacy of an application in the real world and to get its deployment reversed or halted. But taken together, these applications or our analysis calls into question the entire category of algorithms because they suffer uniformly from these seven critiques. And in particular, as I mentioned, we need to sort of push back on developers who come out with claims about predictive optimization. And so the key goal of our paper is to push the burden of evidence onto the developers to proactively justify where their algorithms are legitimate before they can even be deployed. That is, the focus should be on the developers doing these preemptive evaluations rather than civil society members, researchers, and auditors pushing back on these algorithms after they've been deployed and after they've already caused harm. So to this end, we present a rubric for the legitimacy of uh, assessing the legitimacy of predictive optimization. It consists of about 30 specific questions that model developers need to answer and argue for the legitimacy of their algorithm before it can be deployed. Um, there's lots more in the paper, especially, specifically about like, what the alternatives to predictive optimization could be, which we didn't have time to get into because of time constraints. Um, but yeah, if any of this sounds interesting, I hope you'll give our paper a read, and thank you so much. Okay, next up we have a remote presentation uh, on reconciling individual probability forecasts. Oops, let's see if I can get it up. Hi, I'm Aaron Roth and I wanna talk to you about some work that I've done Hi, I'm Aaron Roth, and I want to talk to you about some work that I've done with colleagues here at Penn, uh, Alex and Scott, about resolving predictive multiplicity and thinking about individual probabilities. So in the practice of machine learning and statistics, we very frequently predict uh, individual probabilities. What do I mean by this? Well, things like the probability that it will rain tomorrow in weather forecasting or the probability that Alice will die in the next 12 months in life insurance, or the probability that Bob will be arrested for a violent crime 18 months after his release on parole, or the probability that Carol will develop breast cancer before the age of 50, things like this. These are events that occur only once. And so we don't have the luxury of, repeat, of observing repeated trials and measuring these things. Right? Tomorrow happens only once, Alice has but one life to live and so on. And so it's very difficult to try to claim that we get these probabilities exactly right, because we can't measure them. And if you sort of think hard about it, you might even wonder whether these things are, are properly grounded in the real world. Um, so this is something that philosophers of science worry about. It's also something that has come up in the fact literature uh, under the name model multiplicity or predictive multiplicity. And I want to briefly give you sort of the perspective of both fields on this problem. So in the philosophy of science, this is very closely related to what is called the reference class problem. And to, to give you the classic introduction to the reference class problem, let me describe to you the case of United States versus Shinobi that has become sort of a, a traditional example in this area. So Charles Shinobi was a 34-year-old Nigerian citizen living in New Jersey, working as a toll booth operator. And he was caught at the airport at JFK with 103 balloons filled with heroin. And he was arrested and he was convicted. Um, and although he hadn't been caught from passport records, it was believed that he'd made eight other drug smuggling trips. And the sentencing guidelines in this case required that the court estimate the total quantity of heroin smuggled uh, across all of his trips, not just the trip he was caught on. Okay, but since he hadn't been caught for the eight other trips, um, this hadn't been, hadn't been measured. And so what do you do? Well, a government statistician was tasked with producing an estimate and he did what is perhaps a reasonable thing, he said, okay, well, what is relevant about Charles Chernubi? Well, he's a Nigerian drug smuggler uh, apprehended at JFK between 
you know, some particular dates. These were the dates um, of his first and last trips. And so um, he said, okay, well, you know, we've, we've within these dates, um, arrested other Nigerian drug smugglers at JFK. We know how much, uh, we, we know how much um, heroin they were smuggling. Um, and so we'll just assume that, that Charles Shinobi was, was smuggling the average um, amount um, among all of the people in this reference class. Okay, so here, Nigerian drug smugglers apprehended at JFK is some reference class, but is it the right one? You know, why is it relevant that he was apprehended at JFK? Why is it relevant that he was Nigerian? There are other reference classes he was a member of, right? We could have, we could have compared him to drug smugglers of any nationality apprehended anywhere. We could have, um, we could have conditioned on other things. We could have looked at drug smugglers living in New Jersey apprehended at JFK. We could have looked at people who work as toll booth operators. These are all reference classes that Charles Shinobi is a member of. Uh, and yet, if we had computed this average by averaging over these other reference classes, we would have gotten different answers. Okay, so since Charles Shinobi is a member of all of these reference classes, what privileges one of these answers over another? This is the reference class problem. Okay, uh, very closely related is the model multiplicity problem or the predictive multiplicity pr problem that people in the facts and adjacent literature study. Um, right, so when we train a probabilistic model to predict things like the chance of recidivism or uh, you know, the chance of dying within the next 12 months, we are implicitly committing to a model of individual probabilities. But since individual probabilities are unobserved, uh, we can only sort of measure things over reference classes. How do we adjudicate between two different models? If we've got two different models that make different predictions, which is the right one? Now, one way of doing this is to measure accuracy, right? Over you know a large collection of people, we can we can measure the accuracy of these models in aggregate, and this has you know good foundations behind it. The true individual probability will in fact minimize squared error. So if you have you know two models and one is more accurate than the other, the less accurate model it has been falsified. It cannot represent the true probability. But it can be that I've got two models that are equally accurate. Neither one falsifies the other. And yet they make very different predictions on lots of people. This is sort of the model multiplicity problem or the predictive multiplicity problem. And again, we can ask, what should privilege one of the models over another? OK. So our contention, and, and our paper is mathematical. We, we you know, formalize all of this with, with theorems. Um, our contention is that although individual probabilities are, in fact, fundamentally unknowable, you, you, know, you can't solve that problem, two analysts who agree on the data or at least on what the data distribution is, on how to sample new data, cannot in good faith agree to disagree very much on many individual probabilities. Okay, so in some sense, you know, the punchline is something like um, the model multiplicity problem can't actually arise at scale in good faith. Okay, so here's the basic idea. And again, we formalize this all you know, rhythmically and mathematically in the paper, but the idea is simple. Suppose you've got two models, F1 and F2, and they've got large disagreements on many people. There's a lot of people that these two models predict very different probabilities for. Well, let's look at their disagreement regions. There's the region A on which, you know, it's the set of all people for which model one predicts a higher probability than model two. And we've got region B, uh, the set of all people for whom model two predicts a higher probability than model one. Okay, since the two models disagree on many people, at least one of these regions has to contain a lot of people. It has to be big. But, Say it's model A, right? On, on you know, in, in region A, um, model one systematically predicts higher probabilities for the outcome than model two. And since A is big, we can measure the propensity of the actual outcome. So one of these models has to be wrong on region A in a way that we can uh, measure and falsify from reasonable amounts of data because A is big. That is to say, one of the models must have large statistical bias on one of these two large regions. And if we discover a region in which a model has large statistical bias, we can fix it. And in fixing it, we've improved the error of the model. We've decreased the error. We've made the model more accurate. Now, everyone agrees, everyone should agree that this fix is good because not only have we made the model more accurate, we have sort of eliminated a region of the model in which its predictions had previously been falsified. Now, maybe our two new models agree almost everywhere and we've resolved the predictive multiplicity problem. Or maybe they don't, in which case we can repeat this procedure. But because every step of this procedure decreases the error significantly, and the error can't go below zero, this process can't go on forever. It has to quickly halt 
uh, at two models that we both agree are better than the original models, um, but that themselves agree almost everywhere. So the theorem that we get for, for our very simple algorithm is that there's a reconciliation procedure, a simple algorithm, such that if you feed into it any two models, then within a reasonable number of rounds, it'll spit out two new models that number one, everyone agrees are better than the original models in that they are more accurate, they have lower error, and the models that are spit out um, are not empirically falsified on the reference classes S that we have identified over the course of the algorithm that have empirically falsified the original models. And these two new models agree on almost all of the individual probabilities they predict. That is the uh, model multiplicity problem uh, has become very small. Okay, so everything here is efficient and constructive. We've got modest computational requirements, modest data requirements. Um, and all of this is to say the quantitative degree of disagreement can be quickly driven to zero with more data. Okay, so what's the upshot? Well, participants can have sort of maybe more fundamental disagreements, like what the data distribution even is or what the data really are. But if participants agree on what the data is or how to sample from it, then severe versions of the predictive multiplicity problem cannot arise in good faith because if you and I have competing models that make very different predictions, we can reconcile them, get models that we both agree are better and agree almost everywhere. And you might ask, well, hasn't the predictive multiplicity problem been observed empirically? The answer is, is yes, if what you do is the traditional um, thing in machine learning, which is to find a model by minimizing error in some fixed class, then the model multiplicity problem can arise. The trick is that the reconciliation procedure we introduce uh, cross calibrates these two models and results in new models that are outside of the original class. That's important. And so although individual probabilities are in principle unknowable, we can't solve that problem. Um, what we show is that they are contestable. If you don't agree with the predictions made by my model, then you can propose your own model. And we can negotiate through this reconciliation procedure to agree on new models that um, are, are only improved and yet agree almost everywhere. Um, okay, so, and so maybe like a punchline, we cannot agree to disagree about individual probabilities. Thanks, if you wanna check out the paper, it's on archive. And if you wanna know more about this sort of style of thinking, I, I taught a class on it and there are notes and lectures available at uncertaintyclass.com. Okay, so next up we have Anna Meyer on the data set multiplicity problem. Oops, let me just take that off. Oh my God, I'm very bad with a mouse on a Windows machine. But I will get it. There we go. Oh my God. <laughs> Do you know what your paper number is? Sorry, yeah, it's just very finicky. Okay, that's the wrong session. Here we go. All right, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, how do we get rid of this? Is there, let's present. Try to hide the sidebar. Great, thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Anna. I'm gonna be talking about our work, the data set multiplicity problem, how unreliable data impacts predictions. So let's consider a standard machine learning pipeline. We start with a training data set, we use it to build a model, and then the model makes predictions, um, sometimes about people. Uh, for, for this talk, as a toy example, I'm gonna be talking about data from the American Community Survey um, which is conducted by the US government and a common task in fair machine learning benchmarks is to predict someone's salary from this data set. Um, specifically, um, often to predict whether their salary is above or below $50,000, but for this talk, uh, for right now, I'm gonna be thinking about the regression task. Um, so maybe we have that data set, we train a model, and then the model predicts Bob's salary, and maybe it predicts a salary of $60,000. 
But what if I told you that there's another data set um, and that this data set is just as accurate as the first data set? Um, I'm purposely being a little vague at the moment about what that means, um, but let's just assume that statisticians and domain experts couldn't tell you whether which of these data sets was uh, more error-free or more suited to the prediction task. This data set, even if we follow the same training pipeline, it's probably gonna give us a different model and maybe this model predicts a different salary for Bob, say $70,000. Um, now if you're Bob and you know that there's this data set too out there, you're gonna be disappointed if whoever is developing the algorithm um, to say decide your salary if they use the first model. Um, so that's, that's the type of problem we're thinking about. But a natural question is, is this a realistic setting? Like, is there, a co is there commonly a data set too? Um, and we argue that there is. There's commonly a data set two, data set three, data set N. Um, and this is based on uh, prior work, a lot of it out of the fact community, that shows that data isn't objective. Data can contain, um, statistical biases, it can contain uh, historical and society biases, and data can just contain flat out errors in the labels or features or both. Um, our contribution is to frame this as a multiplicity problem um, and sort of say that we want to consider the whole range of data sets. Um, so for example, um, just one of the ways that this multiplicity could arise. Let's say that we're doing a survey, we're supposed to call Joe on the left with the red dot, but he doesn't pick up his phone, so instead we call the guy on the right. Um, the counterfactual data set with the red dot would be likely viewed as just as valid as the data set that we actually ended up with based on which survey respondents answered their phone. Um, another example is just mistranscribing data. The survey respondent says one thing, um, for whatever reason, the, a different thing gets written down, um, and many more. Um, so as I said, we are talking about this as a multiplicity problem. So to, to talk through our setup um, a little more specifically, um, we might have a collection of N data sets. We could train a model on each of them, and then for a given individual, ask what, what is the range of predictions for this individual? And so um, in this case, the, the range of predictions is $12,000. And so perhaps a priori, we set a threshold that we were okay with predictions varying by. Um, if, that, if we were okay with a range of say $5,000, um, then we would say that uh, the prediction for Bob here is not robust to data set multiplicity because the range of predictions is so large. Um, by contrast, if, if a couple of the predictions were different, the, the bold green ones changed. Um, now in this setting, the range of predictions is only $4,000. So assuming we were still okay with that $5,000 range, this would be fine. We would be confident that no matter which of these data sets we ended up with by chance, uh, the model's prediction on Bob would not meaningfully change. So this is great, but there's a few challenges to making this work in practice. The first challenge is actually defining data set multiplicity. In our paper, we, we walk through examples of what, of what we think data set multiplicity could look like in different situations. Um, however, in practice, when you have a real data set, um, this is gonna be highly uh, highly specific to the situation, and it's also probably subjective, so we, we can't just like uh, give a, an overarching definition. Um, however, we hope that our paper prompts discussions among stakeholders of what shortcomings with data might be. Um, the second challenge is efficiently computing robustness to data set multiplicity. Um, so in the example I walked through, and that's pictured here, um, we have actually enumerated all of the data sets and models. But in practice, that's not gonna be realistic a lot of the time. Um, aside from the computational cost of training many models, um, we sometimes want to consider a combinatorially large or even infinite set of data sets. 
Our paper takes a first step towards the second challenge. We think about linear models where there's error or noise or bias in the labels, and we try to compute the entire range of models. So if the orange line is like the best fit linear model, essentially what we're gonna compute is some, some form of the gray region there. Our approach relies on the observation that when you consider the closed form of linear regression on the right, um, all of the uncertainty when we're only considering changes to the labels is in uh, the label vector, so we can pre-compute this whole thing and then efficiently compute the entire range of values that theta might take on. Um, there's additional details in the paper about uh, how we do this. Um, so next I'm gonna walk us through just a, a small sort of toy example um, to envision how we think this might be used in practice. Um, so these are two, two real data points um, only showing some of their features, but the only features they differ on are gender and occupation. And so we can ask for the first data point. Um, the model predicts using the binary classification task, it predicts less than $50,000 um, as long as fewer than 2.9% of labels are changed. And that's any combination of labels. Um, so assuming we have uh, fairly good confidence in the labels, um, we're probably comfortable with that. Like you have to change a lot of the data that goes into the model to get a different prediction. Um, so essentially, if there's uh, weird idiosyncrasies in how you ended up with your exact data set, that's, that's not of that much concern. Um, by contrast, the second data point, you have to alter just 0.015% of the labels to get the opposite prediction. So here, uh, under almost any reasonable confidence in the data set, um, that's not gonna be robust. Uh, you can potentially change that prediction really easily. So the point of this example is not to have any commentary about whether, whether one of these predictions should be more confident than the other, whether gender and occupation are relevant fields. Rather, it's just to show that different people have different susceptibilities to uh, idiosyncrasies in the data. Our paper contains a lot more. Um, we, we walk through additional data sets and sort of uh, give more empirical analysis. We also think about different multiplicity definitions. Um, so one example would be we think that one label is incorrect and that is sort of the big circle on the right. Um, but depending on the domain, we might be able to tailor that more. Um, so sort of in our, in our toy example of salary data, we might say, for instance, that uh, one salary is incorrect, but it's a salary that corresponds to a woman. Um, so we analyze uh, how that affects the robustness to data set multiplicity as well. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, so next up, we have Jamel Watson-Daniels, and, uh, all right, there we go, multi-target multiplicity. I think it's what, this is Windows? Okay, we got it. Yep. <laughs> Hi, everybody. My name is Jamel Watson-Daniels, and I'm going to present to you our work on multi-target multiplicity, the flexibility and fairness in target specification under resource constraints. So prediction problems are all around us in society um, when it comes to uh, making decisions. So in health, education, employment, finance. But when we are um, translating pro prediction problems into tractable machine learning problems, often there can be multiple reasonable options for target choice. This is the focus of our work today. Um, Multi-target multiplicity when there exist multiple equally good target variable options. So scholars have thought about the relationship between this flexibility and target choice and 
questions around algorithmic fairness. In general, the question is, um, is a particular choice in target going to have more or less disparity for any given group of individuals? One of the most notable examples, and also what was dis discussed in one of the keynotes this week, is this Obermeyer study on dissecting racial bias in a healthcare algorithm. So here, what they do is the goal is to select high-risk patients um, to be given this additional healthcare resource. In this case, the resource is a high-risk care management program, and uh, this is the task that they considered. If you remember from the keynote, um, this algorithm was found to uh, have an underrepresented number of black patients that were selected to receive the resource due to the choice in target. So they chose the cost variable um, instead of other options for target, and this was the source of racial bias. So this sort of label choice bias is often interpreted in the fairness community as they uh, sort of chose the wrong choice and target. And we sort of zoom out and take a more general perspective that often there can be multiple reasonable targets and multiple reasons for uh, selecting these different targets. And we could use in the fairness community a computational framework for characterizing the effect of this target variable choice on individual decisions. So we take this, this concept of multiple target options, we apply what you've learned about today around model multiplicity, so we view this through the lens of multiplicity, and we ask questions around um, how selection rates will um, change over these target options. So, more concretely, um, I'll describe four contributions. So we start with the single target case, and uh, we develop methodology to evaluate predictive multiplicity under resource constraints. Um, we introduced multi-target multiplicity, and we evaluate this um, for predictive allocation task. We um, think about measures of fairness in the sense of disparate uh, selection, uh, for individuals, and then we demonstrate our framework on the healthcare data set presented in the Obermeyer study. So, um, as you've heard, uh, the definitions more concretely model multiplicity or the Rashomon effect is this existence of multiple models that perform almost equally well. So we have a data set and uh, con contrasting my colleagues who, who discussed multiple data sets, our data set uh, is, is constant here and we can train some model um, and there exists multiple models with similar accuracy. So this is the, the, the name of the game today. And then predictive multiplicity uh, sort of refers to this additional uh, question around how predictions will change over this set of models. In predictive multiplicity, we often measure this metric called ambiguity. Ambiguity is how many individuals are assigned conflicting predictions over the set of near-optimal models. So to um, contextualize our work, um, previous work has thought about ambiguity in the context of binary uh, outcomes. So the question here is a conflict becomes, does your uh, decision change from yes, no? or zero, one. Um, previous work has also thought about this in probabilistic classification where a conflict is considered to be a significant change in the risk, the predicted risk, um, but not necessarily a flip from zero to one. And then here today we're gonna talk about this type of predictive multiplicity and resource allocation where uh, we think about um, top ranked individuals being selected to receive a resource under some budget. So here, our ambiguity that we define in the paper is how many individuals are assigned conflicting predictions where an individual's selection changes over the set of near-optimal models. So this is the novelty. The computational approach to uh, computing this is we start out with a single target. Um, we take some subset of the data. We train a baseline optimal model, and then we actually uh, determine unflippable points and remove them from consideration. So this is an improvement on previous work 
Um, and then the next step is we use integer programming methods to calculate the minimum and the maximum rank that can be assigned to each point over the set of near optimal models. And we can use that minimum and maximum to determine if the selection decision changes. So the, the number of uh, individuals whose selection decision changes across our set of models is our ambiguity here. So that's the single target setting. For the second contribution, we introduced the multi-target setting. And here we think about the good models, the set of good models in terms of different target configurations. So each individual target may predict um, our task quite well. Uh, the combination of these targets might also work well. Um, and the combinations of the predictions of individual models could also work in this situation. So we introduced two concepts in the paper. Um, here today I talk about our index model, and this is a simple sort of illustration of what we do in the math, um, where we um, put some weight on each individual target and combine them, and the question becomes how many um, selection de decisions change over these options of combining the targets together. So we call this multi-target ambiguity. How many individuals are assigned these conflicting allocation decisions over our combining procedure options? And our computational approach is here. You see now we select multiple targets and some subset of the data. And for each point, we calculate the, we use integer programming again to calculate the minimum and the maximum rank that can be assigned to these individuals over the combining procedures. So before we were uh, perturbing loss or accuracy, now we're perturbing the combining procedures, and then we can compute ambiguity in the, in the standard way. So the third uh, contribution um, that's related to fairness, we ask how does the selection rate for members in a protected group change when combining these target options? So in this, uh, to answer this question, we um, do the following. We select the multiple targets again, and then we find combining parameters that minimize and maximize now the number of individuals from a protected group that are selected. And this gives us insight about which target option um, has weight in terms of um, minimizing or maximizing disparate impact. And then um, our last contribution is we actually take the Obermeyer, uh, the synthetic data released in the Obermeyer study, and we apply our framework so that we can demonstrate to you how you might use this computational framework to evaluate target options before the algorithm goes out into, um, into being used. So here, if you recall from the keynote, the target options are um, total cost, avoidable cost, and number of chronic conditions. These are the three target options that they consider in this case. And what we do in this paper is we, um, we, we compute our index model, as you see in the sort of last bar on this plot. We have our target options on the x-axis, and then we have our percent outcome covered by the, the people select, the percentage uh, selected in the high-risk program on the y-axis, and for each bar, we hold the um, target variable constant, and then you'll see we compare that to our index model, and what we find is actually uh, we also compute our single target multiplicity for each target option, and we find that when you evaluate this target flexibility in this way, you can, you can easily see that total cost, the same result in the Obermeyer paper, that total cost is highly correlated with um, underrepresenting black patients. You can see this by applying our framework. And you can see additional results in the paper. So for example, we have a um, semi-synthetic experiment that explores uh, the conditions under which you might expect uh, this to show up. So this is figure two. Um, like I said, we compute our single target predictive multiplicity. You'll see this in figure 3A. And then something pretty cool is you can also identify stable points. So my perspective has been to think about uh, conflicting points and predictive inconsistency. But the interesting thing is we also found a stable set of points that do not change no matter which target that you choose. And this might be relevant for some uh, applications. So you should absolutely read our paper. 
Okay, so again, my name is Jamel, and this is our work on multi-target, multiplicity, uh, joint work with Solon, Jake, and Alex, uh, most of who are here if you have questions. And these are our four contributions, and this is how you can reach me. Thank you. Well, thank you. We have one more talk today, which will be remote. statement about why he can't be here, so I'm going to do that. Uh, he said, I did not manage to get the U.S. visa on time for the conference because the window between the paper notifications and the conference itself was too short for applicants that need to go through additional administrative processing. Administrative processing technically applies to all U.S. visa applicants who work on artificial intelligence, although it is invoked by consular officers uh, seemingly arbitrarily. And he just wanted me to say that to raise uh, awareness of this issue. So now go to the talk on arbitrary decisions in uh, differentially private training. Hello, everyone. My name is Bogdan Klinic, and I'm going to talk about our paper called Arbitrary Decisions Are Hidden Costs of Differentially Private Training. Let's imagine a high-stakes predictive model using a hospital environment, uh, which either recommends or not a patient to be admitted into intensive care. Uh, let's say every patient is represented as a point in this illustration over here, and the model is represented as the decision boundary in the middle. If the point is above the decision boundary, then the model recommends to accept them, and if it is below, then it does not recommend to accept them. Let's look at this point over here. It should be admitted into intensive care, uh, but the model has rejected them. And why is that? Of course, all models make mistakes, but what if there exists a very similar model, maybe with the same accuracy that would accept the patient? The phenomenon that there could be different models that are indistinguishable in some way, like have the same accuracy, that have drastically different outputs for the same uh, example, is called predictive multiplicity, and it's a measure of arbitrariness of decisions. In this work, we study a specific approach to train machine learning models called training with differential privacy, which is used when the data is privacy sensitive. And differential privacy uh, does uh, inject special noise during training, so that depending on the random seed, you could end up with this model or this model and this model. And you can immediately see that depending on the random seed, some predictions could be different for certain examples. So this is what we want to study. Our goal too is to investigate the predictive multiplicity properties of differentially private training. So first thing first, we have to figure out how do we actually measure predictive multiplicity in our setting. And for that, we use uh, a notion of predictive multiplicity called disagreement, which is based on prior work. Uh, it's a fairly intuitive notion. Basically, for any two models, f and f prime, coming from our training algorithm, we want to measure the probability that the decisions of these two models are going to disagree on a given example x. And the probability is over the randomness of the train algorithm, which is what we want to study. Uh, note that uh, the data set s, uh, we consider it to be fixed, and same, same goes for the input example x. All fixed, the only source of randomness that we consider is of uh, the training algorithm. So how do we measure uh, disagreement for differentially private models? Well, the first thing that we show in the paper is that for a simple DP mechanism called alpha perturbation, uh, we can actually have a close form characterization in terms of disagreement, and you can check the details in the paper. But this is a very simple mechanism that is not, that is not practical. So what can we do for more complex mechanisms that are used for, uh, for let's say, neural networks and so on? Well, uh, the current work uh, on predictive multiplicity in randomized settings has considered a Monte Carlo algorithm, and we can also uh, do that. In our setting, Monte Carlo method is just a fancy way of saying retrain a bunch of models uh, many times on the same data set. Uh, with regards to that method, we show a series of theoretical results in the paper uh, that show how many times you need to retrain in order to estimate this agreement to a given level of accuracy. So even though the prior work has used the Monte Carlo method, uh, we, don't, we don't really know how many times you would need to retrain. So in our paper, we actually uh, show how many, and we, we have a concrete guide, guidance for that. Okay, so now we have a toolbox for estimating uh, disagreement for differentially private models. 
Now let's audit some models. And uh, we start, we, we, we do that in uh, uh, four tabular tasks that represent high stakes decision settings. One is in credit scoring and three are in healthcare. So for each of these data sets, uh, we train uh, many logistic regression models uh, with uh, varying levels of privacy using a DP mechanism called objective perturbation. And for each level of privacy and each data set, we compute the disagreement of of these models. The first thing that I'm going to show is um, uh, the relationship between the level of privacy and the performance of these models. So as you increase the level of privacy, if you go to the right, um, uh, you see that the performance invariably drops. And that's normal. That's expected because the more privacy you have in differentially private training, the more randomness you, you need in, in the training process. And that destroys the signal, right? Um, so in our roster of tasks, uh, there are some tasks that achieve pretty good performance, uh, such as the mammography um, models and dermatology models. And there are some models that do not perform well, for example, on the credit uh, data set. Now let's look at the disagreement values. Uh, so what I'm going to show now is the average disagreement on the test data set. Right? So we see that as you increase the level of privacy, you invariably get higher average disagreement. Uh, for every data set and for every, for every model, basically. So, um, and this holds both for a task for which we have good performance and uh, for tasks for which we have bad performance. For example, on the credit data set, our performance is not great and we have disagreement close to, close to 100%. Okay, sure, the, the models are bad, so uh, the decisions are arbitrary. But this also holds for, uh, for tasks where the performance is okay. For example, on the dermatology data set, we have between 80 to 85 AC, AUC here, uh, area under the curve, which is a decent performance, I would say, on a table or task. And at the same time, in the same privacy regime, we have 70% uh, disagreement, which is, uh, which is fairly concerning. We also did the same audit for a close to state-of-the-art differentially private neural network uh, on the image classification task. Um, unfortunately, I do not have time to go into details of this one, uh, but we see the same trend. As you increase the level of privacy, you have a higher levels of uh, disagreement. What is interesting, uh, however, here is that even though the levels of disagreement on this task are lower than uh, the levels on the tabular tasks, there still are some examples which achieve 100% disagreement. And this is a trend. This is something that we see uh, on all of our data sets. For instance, on the tabular tasks, um, even though for some, of the, um, for some of the levels of privacy in some of the data sets, the average disagreement is fairly low. For example, on the mammography data set, we have the best uh, performance on these data sets in our roster of tasks. But you can see that even though average disagreement could be very low here, um, there are examples that attain every possible value of disagreement here between, between zero and one. The spread is, is huge. So this is also fairly concerning. Um, so what have we learned in these audits? We have seen that higher privacy, higher level of privacy in differential private training implies higher uh, disagreement. And the disagreement also can be uh, tricky to measure because it's distributed unevenly across the population. But uh, so what, right? Um, actually, one could argue that high predictive multiplicity is, is good. And folks have done uh, these arguments in, uh, in the prior literature. Uh, high predictive multiplicity could mean that you're overcoming algorithmic leviathans. It could also mean that you're um, achieving individual fairness. And all of these arguments are fair, but they are not applicable to our setting of differential private training. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into detail, but in the, in the paper, we, we argue that actually in our setting of differential private training, predictive multiples cannot be good. It's, it's a concern, it's a normative concern, and it's a concern in terms of reliability because the models uh, give out arbitrary decisions. And as a, as a result, as a conclusion, we, um, we argued that before deploying differential private models, we need to measure their predictive multiplicity. We need to audit their predictive multiplicity. 
And we um, ideally would want, want to also do that in deployment. Perhaps we could communicate the level of arbitrariness. We could communicate the level of predictive multiplicity to decision subjects. However, in uh, differential, differentially private uh, settings, it's unclear how to do so because such communication would also leak information potentially about the training data. In conclusion, what we've done in this paper is we provided a provable way to calculate the required number of retrainings in order to estimate disagreement in randomized algorithms in general and differentially private algorithms in particular to any given level of accuracy. And this gives a concrete, concrete tool for practitioners that enables to measure disagreement, as I mentioned, in, in sort of audits. We have discovered that differential privacy invariably increases predictive multiplicity when the level of privacy increases across a range of tasks and models. And even if predictive multiplicity is in low on average, there exist examples and groups for which it is still high. This is what I've covered in the talk. In the paper, we also um, discuss the relationship between predictive multiplicity accuracy and privacy. And we have shown that the trends that uh, I've, I've, I've shown before uh, also hold even at the level of model confidence scores. So if we don't care about decisions, but the confidence scores, we still have higher multiplicity. So this concludes my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and please check the paper for more details. Okay, so we have uh, only a few minutes for questions. So can I get the speakers to come up here? Um, if anyone has a question for Bogdan, he is online on chat right now. I don't think we have Hopin on this computer to get him on the video as well, but uh, maybe I'll ask first. Are there any questions about this last talk that anyone wants to pose? And um, I think he can hear us if he's watching. Sure. Uh, yeah, I want, you, you said um, arbitrary decisions several times, but you're talking about uh, algorithms that are using randomization, and random is not always arbitrary, and I wonder if you could distinguish between the two. Okay, um, I can type that into chat uh, since we can't get him in if he doesn't, if he didn't hear that. So um, now if we wanna start taking questions for these. Um. Um, so for Sayash and Angelina, I was just wondering um, why uh, legitimacy specifically? Um, because it seems like what you're mostly doing is pointing out the ways in which these uh, models are kind of just perform badly, right? So, and normally in, in the context of political philosophy, that would be that they're unjustified, they fail in that sense. Um, so what is it specifically about legitimacy that you're really targeting? All these companies, we find that they make claims of fairness, accuracy, and efficiency, um, and the fact that they're not living up to what they claim to be doing is kind of the notion of legitimacy that we're attacking. And also, almost in a way, it's these claims that justify the use of these models and these, these claims that make these companies legitimate in the first place. So for instance, uh, when Optum sells its healthcare model to hospitals, one of the claims it's make, it makes is that, look, we can sort of get rid of like your hospital staff to some extent, you can fire these admin workers, and so the legitimacy that comes, the only reason it is like legitimate in the eyes of the hospital to do this is because they say that this is a higher accuracy than um, a, a worker doing this. Yep, next. Hi, thanks. This is also for uh, Sayash and Angelina. I love the paper. Um, and I, I guess the question that I had was, is it primarily an empirical finding that these, that these uh, examples of predictive optimization fall short, or is there something inherent about the seven qualities or some subset of the qualities that arise from how you've defined this category of, um, of predictive problems? Like, is, is the main takeaway that there's argumentation that, that this problem implies these seven issues, or is it just like a, a very common pattern in practice that, that when people actualize these optimizations, they have these problems. Um, I think that's a, that's a good question. I think the link goes both ways to some extent. So um, in some sense, the conceptualization is independent of the problems themselves. So the problems are much more like inductive or empirical in that sense that we've deployed these systems in the past and we've seen these issues occur. But 
then when we like take a step back and look at like the density of the matrix, I think it also begs the question of, is it even possible to build algorithms that claim to be efficient and accurate and fair while still predicting futures? And at least based on the current evidence we have, I think the answer is no. Uh, hi, I'm sorry, this is also a question for Angelina and Sayash. The whole panel was great, so congrats to all the speakers. But um, the question that came to my mind was, um, in terms of evaluating legitimacy of these algorithms, I understand the prediction part, the optimization I understand less well. So for example, if you had a rules-based algorithm at like a border crossing or like police stop or something, that's also an algorithm and it could also be illegitimate along the same arguments. Like what is the role of optimization here? Could you talk a bit about that? This is also kind of related to the previous point. So the three criteria we have for predictive optimization, um, our critiques kind of stem from that. And so all, all algorithms that fall outside of predictive optimization, like hand-coded rules, some of our critiques will still apply to them, but not all of them because of how they're formulated. Um, and so for example, for this one, if you have hand-coded rules, that can be more interpretable to people. And so in our paper, we have an example about vaccine allocation where um, that does become more contestable because it is very easy for everyone involved to kind of understand the rules there. And so while some of our critiques apply to that case, um, they're like most densely applied to things that fall under all three of these criteria. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we can take a, one last question. Um, does anyone have one for author, other authors besides Angelina? Uh, this question is for Jamel. Thanks for the great talk. Uh, I'm, so in the current results, a lot of them are using protected attributes to define the groups. Yeah. I'm curious if there are methods to kind of discover groups that might be having high multiplicity. They might not correspond with the protected attribute. Um, and if there are ways we can kind of predictably characterize groups that are prone I to see. this. Oh, I see. So you're saying, okay, this is a good question. So it sounds like you're saying that, uh, so the current formulation that I presented, I have, um, if I have a protected group, then I can determine, uh, I can gain insights about which target variable impacts that group in what way. And it sounds like your question is, maybe can it flip in the sense that, can I gain insights by looking at the targets and the changes in predictions of what types of groups are impacted. Yeah, I think so. I don't think we did that, but I, uh, we have the, you could use our framework still to frame that question, um, like pretty naturally. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Okay, so let's thank all our presenters one more time.